So, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Maria Izquierdo. I am a full professor of nutrition here at the campus. I am teaching here at the campus in the, in the field of nutrition, in human nutrition. And, and Antonina and Evelina invite me to chair this, this, this session uh, where also Andrea, the next speaker, will present a, a, a research that I am involved in. Okay, so if you, if you agree, so let's, let's begin. In. Also, I will ask to keep, frame the, uh, to, keep, to keep the frame of time like 10 minutes. I will raise my hand because we are, I mean, we are supposed to finish at 1.15. So I, I will be quite annoying with the time, so. Sorry about that, but I wear you. Okay, so let me introduce the first speaker. It's Andrea Rizzo. is a PhD candidate here at the University of Barcelona. She works as project manager at the University of Barcelona for the Uni Eco project, focusing on collaborative tools and practice for the implementation of the planetary health diet in universities, and also work supporting the participatory process of developing the Barcelona uh, 2030 Sustainable Food Strategy. Her research interests revolve around the sociology of food and in particular studying what mechanisms can elevate food insecurity and create a more sustainable food system as well as exploring the role of citizens in climate action through food. She holds a bachelor degree in sociology and a master degree in social transformation and innovation. So whatever you want, you have 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. It's so well, uh, hi everyone, my name is Andrea, and the Planetary Health Diet in University Canteens is a study I carry out for my master thesis together with my tutors on the acceptance and satisfaction and also the behavioral changes in the university community when introducing uh, sustainable and healthy food choices. First of all, uh, what is the Planetary Health Diet? Um, this term was created in response to the need to transform the food system and to establish global strategies. Thus, in 2019, the Lancet Commission established the first scientific goals for healthy and, uh, and sustainable systems, including this cre the creation of this planetary health diet um, concept. Uh, the Planetary. <laughs> the planetary health diet is a flexitarian um, dietary pattern uh, that is based mainly on um, plant-based foods, but might, might include occasionally some amounts of uh, meat, fish, and dairy products. The planetary health diet is uh, aimed to um, optimize human, uh, human health without exceeding planetary boundaries, and it is uh, designed to adapt to the different uh, local context. Uh, this is why it takes into the consideration aspects such as proximity, sessionality of the products, reduction of meat consumption, and reduction of food waste. So to um, explain how the initiative came about, it is important to talk about these two aspects. Firstly, in 2015, Barcelona uh, joined an, an international agreement called the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. And uh, um, that is, well, the objective of this was to create, uh, to take effective actions for food in cities. Uh, as part of the adhesion, Barcelona was uh, selected as the other uh, signatory cities of the part, uh, pact of the World Sustainable Food System in 2021. As a result, a whole series of uh, projects and uh, food actions began to be deployed in order to to respond to the um, emer uh, climate emergency at the local level. And on the other hand, we have this, um, as part of the, um, masters, uh, of the Masters of Sociology, a team made up by students and lecturers from the um, economics of the University of Barcelona participate in this project, in European project called UNIECO, which aim to um, develop um, collaborative tools and, uh, and for 
It's for the uh, for the um, for make the campus a more sustainable places. So our proposal was um, at the mean the improving the university um, catering service by uh, introducing a menu that. Um, uh, that have the guidelines and the principles of the planetary health diet. The project was highly commended at international level and uh, was the first, uh, win the first place at the, at the University of Barcelona, so, which uh, led the university's commitment to support the implementation of a pilot test of the proposal in two faculties. Uh, so in this picture, we can see an example of an uh, advertising flyer with a menu designed by people from the, <laughs> from the food campus of the University of Barcelona. So um, we uh, realized that in Spain and in the Spanish context, actually there were previous experiences about uh, changing dietary patterns from um, uh, the grown up in children's uh, canteens. However, there were like few, um, like few experiences focused on the evaluation of these initiatives and also on, um, the, on the impact of the, um, on the impact of improving the healthy and sustainable uh, food in the public spaces where the consumer choice is deliberate. So given this lack of data, we propose, um, and models such as the planetary health diet, we propose these two questions of research. That is, what is the level of, of individual satisfaction and acceptance of the planetary health diet menu? And what are the attitudinal and behavioral impacts of these uh, that, that the planetary menu can generate in the university community? So likewise, in this study, based on um, the implementation of a pilot test of the uh, planetary health diet menu in two faculties of the University of Barcelona during one week, uh, the aim of, of, the, of this study was uh, um, um, to, study, to analyze the um, acceptance and satisfaction as well as a wider attitudinal and behavioral changes in the university community. So we decided to take this planetary health diet menu and also um, the standard menu of the faculty in order to compare and to determine the real impacts of the experience. So as regarding the methodology, it is an evaluation of, um, it's an evaluation of a pilot study with a mixed method analysis uh, through a qualitative, uh, a qualitative phase based on two focus groups. The first one uh, before the intervention with the student representatives of the university and, and the other one after the intervention with a, a sociology master's students to deepen in, in the understanding of impacts, um, uh, perception of the, of the experience. And also we have um, this quantitative part based on an observational study based on quest and two questionnaires, one before the intervention um, about, related to the standard menu and one after the intervention related to the planetary health diet menu. The items that we, um, uh, the, the items studies were mainly five, the satisfaction, acceptance, the eating habits, the self-perception of sustainability and the willingness to pay. So this is the sample, the focus group. Okay, so the results are, go uh, are gonna be presented below. Um, first, uh, I have to say that for the quantitative analysis, two um, techniques were used. The first one is the basic frequency analysis and the other one is uh, a student T samples for um, independent, uh, the student, uh, student T uh, samples for independent variables. Uh, that is, was mainly for uh, um, determine the difference between two groups, in this case for the two menus. So we have uh, in, this, in this graph, we see that the um, average evaluation given to the standard menu is 5.5 uh, five, 5 out of 10, um, which would correspond to a level of satisfaction between low and moderately satisfactory, 
and for the battery health diet menu is 7.7 .7 out of 10, that which correspond to a notably level of satisfactory. So the data obtained um, support the hypothesis one. So uh, on average, the evaluation was uh, uh, the, the evaluation was better for the planetary health diet menu than for the standard menu of the faculty. We have this second graph that corresponds about the self-impacts related to sustainability. Um, we can see that um, in four of the five items presented, the dietary health diet menu is, uh, has like um, a more, um, a more um, engaged with the students and, and teachers and other staff from the university. So the, the, um, the, the items that have the higher means are um, uh, since I consume the menu, I, um, I talk with my friends and families about my dietary patterns. Uh, I'm, since I, I, I taste the menu, I'm aware of the diet and the, of, the, of my dietary food impacts. And also, um, since I uh, taste the, the menu, um, makes me feel makes me feel good. So the third one is terms related to the acceptance. We can see that in both cases, for people who have tried the menu and for people who have not tried the menu, we have higher levels of acceptance. But it is important to say that the levels are higher for uh, those who did try the menu. Um, for uh, in terms of willingness to pay, we can see that the. Um, uh, that whether they have tried the menu or whether not, the willingness to pay is, is very similar in both cases with a minimum, within the maximum and minimum values, with an ideal price between uh, five and nine euros. So these results are uh, contradictory <coughs> what, uh, of what we have put in the, um, in the hypothesis that the uh, users or the participants are not willing to assume this high cost for the introduction of this kind of menu. And finally, we have these um, uh, six uh, themes that we extract from, from the um, um, qualitative analysis. The first one is the perception of the standard menu. Uh, most of the students um, said that they have not tried the menu basically for the lack of um, consideration of the, of the intolerances, the, um, the allergens, and also because the lack of consideration of aspects such as the uh, diversity religion in the university and veganism, for example. Another important factor is the, is the price. And also the third one is the, the um, disassociation between food and environment. Because most of them consider themselves like very uh, consciousness about the environment and they make like, and, and they take sustainable actions like um, reducing the, um, the, the consumption of clothes or uh, um, saving water and electricity. But they, they, there wasn't like any, this spontaneous link between uh, the food that we eat and the environmental impact that it has. Another one is the guilty overburden um, to the citizens about this environmental responsibility. They, they say that uh, they want like, a change of the discourse and to appeal to the citizens uh, to take action, not by imposing, but to contribute it. Uh, we have these, um, these positive feelings that, they, that the students have that they are like contributing to the environment through their food and this is um, um, show in the dissemination of the planetary health diet initiative and their own experience with their whole family and friends. And finally, we have this university as an able space for uh, facilitating the access to sustainable and, and, and healthy food because all the participants point out that it is necessary that actions such as the planetary health diet um, menu in the in the spaces um, like the universities because these legitimize the um, in a practical in a practical way the discourse of the climate action raise awareness and have a, and can have a great impact due to the frequent to the uh, given to the um, uh, lot of people who frequent uh, access to the university at the, on daily basis so to conclude um, 
<laughs> so, to conclude, uh, we have um, a better evaluation of the plantar health diet menu and a more positive impact of it than uh, compared to the standard menu. And uh, it is important to note that the, that the price is an important factor that maybe hinders, hinders the, the use of the cafeteria. And finally, it said that we have two limitations of the study. The one is that it was implemented only for one week, so it's difficult to see that can generate a, a, a long-term uh, impact. And the second one is a limitation of the observational, obs observational design, per se, that is that uh, uh, there is no like uh, implication of the researchers, so it's very difficult to determine if the students who were to try the menu are, are previously motivated and have a more favorable predisposition to accept the plantar health diet. But to resolve this, uh, bias, this selection bias, we um, uh, encourage different students and staff members of the faculty to try the menu the, the week of the implementation. So that's all. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for one question or comment or Okay. So, thank you, Andrea, and the next speaker will be Jilit Jill is professor of environmental and health in the environmental studies program at the University of Colorado at Boulder and senior research at the Barcelona Institute of Global Health. She received her PhD in, in environmental health and public policy from the jo Johns Hopkins Bloomer School of Public Health. She has worked on a variety of issues related to the built and natural environments and health, including urban brownfields, cleanup and redevelopment, lead poisoning, residential demolition, environmental justice, chemical risk assessment, housing, green spaces, community garden, and local food system. Wow, good. <laughs> Currently, she's leading the re reimagining environments for connection and engagement testing actions for social prescribing in natural spaces, recitas, or, or I don't know how do you pronounce it. Recetas. Ah, recetas. So yes. It's, it's Spanish <laughs> recetas. <laughs> Consortium funded for the European Commission Horizon 2020. So, and, the, and she's going to explain us, is the other one, a state of the art evidence of the health impacts of community gardening. Thank you very much. And Thank you for the introduction and good morning. It's really nice to be here. I keep learning about Barcelona even though I've been here since 2016. Uh, so it's nice to be on your campus. <laughs> so I'm going to talk, um, present some recent results of a randomized control trial on gardens. So I'll do a little bit of setup on the gardens health connection. Is it too close, I think? Is that better? Um, and then also introduce Rosetta's very, very briefly. I was planning on 15. I hope we can negotiate on 12. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel nice today. So I start off with this question of why, why gardens and health? So that's where we'll begin. And then what do we know about the literature so far? And then what can we do to build on this and actually make some impact in terms of the practice and policy context. This is from yesterday, so I really enjoyed the visit um, at one of the gardens, it's all familiar. Uh, so why do we approach it? So I've been working on this probably since 2005 when I was approached by an organization in Denver, Colorado, where I have spent most of my career. And it was the executive director of a nonprofit there called Denver Urban Gardens, and they said, you know, we have this system of 40 gardens, we think it's having an impact, but we have never evaluated it, would you help us? I was trained as an environmental health scientist, and I hadn't really done work in land use and planning and green space, but I thought, you know, we have the skills, we can do this. Well, it caught my attention, the data flew off the pages, and I thought, this is really interesting. Something is going on in this context. Maybe we could use it as a model system to understand how behavior changes and how can we intervene at the community level to make an impact. Why this is interesting. Okay, so the health context, just a little bit of health data. 
60% of adults have one or more chronic diseases in the population. This is US data, but it's very relevant to the European context and beyond. Diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, liver disease, and some cancers like colon and breast. In the United States, we are sadly leading the way. 74% of adults are overweight or have obesity, some kind of diagnosis. All of these conditions we know are influenced by diet, physical inactivity, as well as stress and anxiety. So there's a whole range of behaviors that we could start to intervene on if we want to prevent the disease and manage it once it takes hold. Here's one example, nutrition. Fiber, we know, is an important aspect of nutrition. It's critical to inflammatory and immune responses, um, and therefore critical to preventing disease and promoting health. We know adults should be getting about 20 to 38 grams of fiber a day, but guess what? We are not even close to getting that. In the American diet, for sure, and sadly, it's changing in Europe again and elsewhere. The other thing we know is that if you tell someone to eat more fiber, they might nod their head and walk away. Maybe they could do it for a week, but it's just hard to change behavior is like the other point I want to make. We also know from the social sciences, and Ashby will talk about this later, and probably Wendy uh, maybe a little bit more, um, is that engaging people in activities that they love has, a ha has the possibility of actually getting to behavior change. If you start at a place of, I love doing this, you'll probably stay with it. So these are kind of stealth health interventions if we can just get to, get to where people are. And this also points to this idea of motivational interviewing when you think about the healthcare context, and that's just planting a seed, excuse the pun, for later. <laughs> Physical activity is also important. We know we need to get 150 minutes a day, on average, of moderate to vigorous physical activity to lead a healthy life. But we, most people do not meet this requirement. We know that increasing physical activity is good for home, hormone regulation, preventing cancer, and keeping our immune systems functioning well. Again, telling someone to get on a treadmill doesn't work. We keep trying it, we educate people, we tell them everything they need to know, but at the bottom, the bottom line is we don't see it in the statistics. Again, thinking about things that people love, maybe that's a way to get the exercise we need while enjoying the activity. Stress and anxiety is another area where we think we can make an impact with community-based solutions because there's such high levels of stress and anxiety in the population. Again, we know all the reasons why we shouldn't be stressed, but we're stressed just thinking about the stress that we have. <laughs> so what do we do? Okay, so that's where the gardens come in. This is the big setup, is that it becomes, and this is why it kind of hooked me as a non-gardener, but a health scientist, that maybe this is the model. And I can assure you, I never got this at Johns Hopkins University. Like, we never talked about community-level interventions. Now we do, but then we didn't. Maybe it's this model system where we can study how nature-based solutions can change behavior and improve health, both physically and mentally. The other beautiful thing about gardens is they're everywhere. They may not be formal. They may be informal, which is more typical in Barcelona. Denver has this formal system. I mentioned there were 40 gardens. Now there's 180. So they really are cropping up in every neighborhood in the city. And wherever you pivot around the world, you will find gardens. It's like the underbelly of a community. Whenever I travel, it's the first thing I want to know is where are the gardens? Because then you find the gardens and you kind of know where a community is. And you really get a feel for how people live and connect with each other. Even if there's no backing of the government, people find a way to grow food. So what do we know? So this is kind of, this is going to be the literature review, <laughs> is that we put this model together based on literally hundreds of studies. But the take home is that most studies are observational, they're qualitative. It doesn't, it doesn't diminish the research, but, but we need to go a little further because what we can't answer from the majority of the research, like these arrows could go in a lot of different directions, because we can't answer the question of cause and effect. If we don't address the issue of selection bias, it's like, did people already come to the garden feeling great? Did people take advantage of the planetary health diet because they already want to have that diet? We can't answer that question. 
without randomization. So this is why we decided to do a trial. Um, we have all this research out there. It helped us put together this model that shows that gardens as a community-based environmental intervention could affect the long range, mm, how do I do the pointing? Maybe here. Ah, yeah. You see it? Okay, this is where we wanna be down the road. This is where we're starting, and there's a lot of processes along the way. But we thought if we could start to hit these modifiable risk factors, we would change the course of the things really giving way to chronic disease and quality of life. So that's, and the, the, the mechanisms that Ashby's gonna talk about next are kind of here, about the social relationships, the contact with nature, the active participation. These are all the levers in gardens as an intervention. These are the levers of what nature-based solutions could offer people getting involved, getting your hands dirty, feeling good, and then possibly getting to these longer range outcomes. So I continue. Um, we decided to do a trial. It's not an easy undertaking. It took us five years to get funded. We got funded by the American Cancer Society. So we went to other funders. They said maybe, but no. And then eventually the American Cancer Society, bless their hearts, gave us the green light. So we put together this team of investigators from a lot of different disciplines to help us do this kind of interdisciplinary, multi-sectoral study of gardens. Um, the main things we wanted to do was develop this two-armed, observer-blinded, randomized control trial. So we ran it like a drug trial. We were blinded to the results to the end. <laughs> and then we released the blind and we published the results. Um, we looked at it among low-income, multi-ethnic adult population in Denver, and it allowed us, again, to look at these questions of behavior change um, for people who, to, to really understand the differences between those who garden and those who are assigned to wait. So key elements, the study ran from 2017 to 2020. We ran three waves of data collection with a total of 291 individuals randomized Oh, and the other piece is we looked at new gardeners because we wanted to know, could you pick up something new and be successful with it? Not just people who are established. So these were folks new to gardening. We assigned them to a garden plot, so the intervention group or the wait list. We looked at diet, random recalls, um, three of them over three time points at baseline, harvest, and follow-up. We put monitors on folks. We looked at physical activity, monitored for seven days at each time point measured, like adhered to the thigh. Um, and then we did health assessments. We also did objective body weight, uh, body measurements. The gardeners received a plot. They received classes, plant seed starts. It was essentially a natural experiment because this already existed. We were just testing whether, it, how it works, whether it works and how it works for health outcomes. Um, the other piece I'll say is it was a very low dose intervention. So we did very little. And we found that there were changes in nutritional outcomes, specifically fiber. Um, it doesn't look like a lot, 1.4 grams of fiber per day increase than the control group. It's about an increase of 7%. But again, we did, this was not a nutrition intervention. With more support, like we think that there's a way to amplify this, but it, it's in the right direction. We also saw physical activity increase by 42 minutes a week, which is something. The recommendation is 150 minutes per week. We're getting people almost a third of the way, again, with very little effort. Two or three times a, bit a week, people go about an hour a visit or two hours, but that's kind of registering, and we captured this through these objective measurements. And then the other piece that was important is we saw stress and anxiety go down. So as a result of the trial, based on the metrics that we used, the gardening group had less stress and anxiety than the control group. And importantly, for those who came with higher levels in the beginning, they had greater reductions. So this is really significant from a clinical perspective because you want to start to move the needle on reductions in stress and anxiety for a whole range of outcomes. 
So this is the results. They're published in the Lancet Planetary Health, just came out in January. We, again, have been sitting on this paper for a year and a half, not because we're not trying, but it was a really tough paper to write with so many outcomes um, and a very, very strict review process. But, but now it's out, so please check it out. It's an open access mm -hmm. article. Um, and, and so basically what we showed was that gardening is an example of a nature-based solution that can change behavior um, even for people who are new to it, that the solution was successful among diverse backgrounds and circumstances. So it didn't, the results did not differ by race, ethnicity, age, or sex. We could begin to think about it as a legitimate health expenditure, something that we could start to fold into our toolbox for preventing and treating disease and promoting health. And the big question for me is can we leverage this to think about other nature-based solutions in our cities that have the same mechanisms, tactile, emotional, social support, nature-based. So, quickly mentioning Rethethas, <laughs> it is our new Horizon project, Horizon 2020, where we're testing social prescribing as this mechanism that is nature-based, that will bridge the nature-based solutions and activities and resources in our communities with health promotion and that maybe we can legitimize nature as an antidote to a variety of health conditions. The highlights is that we're gonna test and validate nature-based social prescribing interventions in six cities, Barcelona, Cuenca, Helsinki, Marseille, Melbourne, and Prague. Three of the cities will do a randomized control trial, three will do pre-post studies. We're using social network analysis and co-creation processes to basically design these menus of social prescriptions. Social prescriptions, the quick definition is these are non-medical community referral systems. And thinking of it like a prescription, but it's not pharmaceutical, it's socially based, it's using resources in our community, and it's working with care professionals in addition to physicians, but also nurses, practitioners, social workers, and so forth who refer people into this kind of uh, intervention, the social prescription. This is an example of a menu coming out of Barcelona where we've done these co-creation processes, we've worked with stakeholders, community members to identify resources. This is Roquetas um, as one example. These menus will be developed in 10 neighborhoods in Barcelona. This model is replicated elsewhere. Um, and in the trials, we will look at whether these kinds of interventions we're focusing on loneliness, so it's a slightly different outcome than the other studies that we've done. Um, but can the same idea work of using nature-based solutions to address loneliness in the context of using group-based intervention, 12-week curriculum, connecting people with nature in a variety of different activities, and then looking at the changes over time of one year? Recruitment's open, so if you do work with an organization in Barcelona that you feel like there's populations that might be interested in participating, we are trying to recruit 300 people to the study this year. Um, and so that's my wrap up, thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> happy to take any questions, um, and then also just paper citations that I think the slides will be available for everyone if you want more information. So thank you very much. Thanks. It was really interesting. And there, actually there is a gardening next to my building, so maybe I will apply for the next year. <laughs> okay. Because every day they, they change the people, like there is like a kind of lottery, uh -huh. and you can oh, apply yeah, for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I will. So thank you very much. Thanks. Any question? Comment? No? So, one. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Do you know if there are projects in Germany like like this? I don't know of any, <laughs> but I'm sure it's there. Okay. We just don't. We haven't identified them. Okay. <laughs> Another question. Um, did you say <clears throat> uh, recruitment is open? You mean uh, you're looking for universities wanting to participate in the research, or what did you mean by it's recruitment to, is I open? Can, sorry, 
There's a lot of echo, maybe a little further away. We cannot hear oh. you really well. Um, recruitment is open, I saw on your slide. What did you mean by that? She means participants to actually record data in the project uh, who are doing the urban gardening, not the uh -huh. universities. So I think you've already chosen your cities, haven't you? Yes. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And sorry, what, what does mean NBSP? So nature-based strategy P? Nature-based social prescribing. Prescribing. Or yes. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you. So our next speaker will be Ashby. No, Ashby. You what? Ashby, I think it's she's coming. Okay, I, I will start introducing you, Ashby. Ashby Lavelle Sachs is a postdoctoral fellow fellow for the Recetas Recetas project targeting loneliness with nature-based activity at the Barcelona Institute of Glo Global Health. Ashby holds a PhD in environmental studies from, from is the University of Colorado, Boulder? Yes. Okay. Um, where she studied loneliness, social connect, oh my goodness, there are horrible words for me that, social connectedness and prescribing time in nature. Previously, Ashby completed her BA in French language and a minor in landscape architecture at the University of Virginia and a master's degree in public horticulture with Longwood Gardens and the University of Delaware in, in, in the USA. Additionally, Ashby worked in botanic gardens such as the Thomas Jefferson Monticello, the Royal Botanic Gardens in London, Tresco Abbey Gardens in Cornwall, United Kingdom also, as well as the Philadelphia Museum of Art and Golden Parks and Recreation in Golden. Colorado as an horticular, oh my goodness, horticulturalist, educator, administrator, fundraiser, and research. You have a really nice work, <laughs> working with gardens. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, yeah. Ashby, so. I appreciate it. Um, is there a presenter view? Um, like, on, like a presenter view? Here. But if you um, like with the notes for the presenter, uh, or, or the presenter, yeah. I don't know this. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, oh, you. Oh, oh. I just have some quotes I wanted to read in the notes, but I can use my computer right okay. here. I'll just okay. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for your patience. Um, happy to be here. Uh, so this presentation will present some of the qualitative research from the garden trial that Jill described earlier. Jill uh, was my graduate advisor at CU Boulder, so I've learned a lot from her and I'm really happy to share some of the work we've done together. Um, so in this presentation, I'll, I'll talk some, a bit about gardener motivation, similar to what Wendy will describe a little later. And um, just before we get started, this, um, the project was funded by the CAP study that Jill led, described earlier, as well as some student grants at my university. And through my partners in Montpellier, we're also funded as well for this, through this grant here. So I'll give you a brief overview of the context of the study. I'll describe our research approach. I'll summarize it, and then I'll uh, connect it to the Resetas project that Jill described. So just a bit of background. Um, the foundation of this project stems from the growing understanding that there are important social ties that um, are able to take place between people when they spend time together in nature. We know that um, people spending time together outdoors exhibit increased generosity towards others. They might, if there's nature near their apartment complex, they increase their use of the common spaces around them and they trust their neighbors more in certain studies. 
This leads to um, nature and neighborhoods may lead to more neighborhood cohesion, willingness to trust others, like I said. And also, people spending time in nature are shown to exhibit more pro-social behavior. So a lot of interesting research happening to try to understand spending time in nature with others leads us to come together with other people. So uh, the problem that this, this is a dissertation chapter um, that I'll describe is loneliness that Jill touched on. Um, but what is loneliness exactly? Uh, it's basically this uncomfortable feeling that we have resulting from the disparity in the social connections that we want and the social connections that we have. So why is loneliness a bad thing? Could it just be like, I don't feel good, I want to be closer to others? Why is it such a bad public health problem? Well, we know that people that are lonely, it shows it's actually very bad for your mental and physical health. Um, being lonely can affect your anxiety and depression, increase it, as well as affect your cardiovascular health and possibly your mortality. And it's really hard to treat loneliness because we can't just, if somebody is screened at a primary care center, there's not a clear direction on next steps to take for the lonely person. And um, however, uh, something that Jill described earlier, social prescribing is a novel uh, solution to loneliness that's getting a lot of attention now. So what is social prescribing? As Jill described, it is a community referral. So a healthcare professional or a social worker or an educator might connect with a lonely person and refer them to a community um, organization that gets people together socially. So um, the context of this research is nature-based social prescribing. So could gardening be, as Jill mentioned, a health um, intervention that people are sort of referred to if they're lonely or unhealthy? So this study, um, to me, it's just natural to be in the garden. A multi-site investigation of new community gardener motivation using self-determination theory. So I'm sorry for the long and technical academic title, but I'll just basically tell you what the study is. Um, we used two different study sites, the Denver Garden Study that Jill described, and a similar project in Montpellier, France, that was sort of modeled on the CAP study. It was a quasi-experimental community gardening study with about 175 um, participants. So almost half the size of Jill's study in Denver. So what I did was I took a subsample of 15 participants in both studies and interviewed them to see how their first year of gardening went to try to understand how did it go and what made them want to continue if they continued or what made them want to quit just to try to understand how could gardening be an intervention for people who have never done it before. We need to know how the new gardener's first year went. So I used um, self-determination theory. This is a really popular theory um, to sort of frame my argument. So just to briefly describe what this is, the idea is that these three core psychological needs need to be met in order for someone to feel self-determined, like motivated to do an activity. I need to feel like I'm competent at the activity. I need to feel like I'm autonomous, meaning this activity, I, can, I have my, autonomy is sort of hard to describe, but my independence, my willingness to act on my own, so I'm not being controlled by another person. And I feel related, connected to important others. So I use those constructs to help understand the findings from the study. Like I said, I had interviewed 15 gardeners in both cities. They were uh, conducted, I conducted them in French and, trans and translated them to English. And then we worked with several coders, looking through the transcripts to code to see what we found for gardener motivation. Using these three themes of autonomy, competency, and relatedness to structure our research. Um, let's see, in Denver, the average age was about 40, Montpellier 49. They were all new gardeners. Uh, mostly women and uh, a fairly diverse population. Well, I guess two-thirds white in Denver, and we didn't co collect race or ethnicity data in Montpellier. So here I have um, my computer, and I just want to read you a couple of the quotes um, because they're pretty powerful. But as far as competence, what do we find? Participants in both countries express feeling competent in their skills after they gardened more. So the more they practiced, the more competent they felt. That wasn't very surprising. Um, however, it was interesting to see that competence was really related to relatedness. So uh, I'll just read you a quote. Someone said in uh, Montpellier, I don't think I could have done it by myself. Just talking about it got people to help. 
So people started helping me once I started talking about it. And she said, that was my biggest fear, that I was, that I was going to kill this tomato. It would, it would fry in the sun, but it actually grew, and that was the highlight of my whole season. I forget how to move forward. Here we go. <laughs> okay, and autonomy. We also found that autonomy was connected to relatedness. To provide a quote, a woman described what motivated for her. She described feeling free in the garden. She said, it's a moment of meditation, of relaxation. We have nothing else to do. We're not challenged by anything else. She's just empowered to be fully present on her own with the activity at hand. And when others were more available to support the new gardeners, we saw that they did express more feelings of autonomous, like I can do this on my own. And then relatedness. Um, the warmth of the social atmosphere in each garden had far-reaching consequences for how successful new gardeners felt. So we found that the relatedness was really key in providing support. And someone described how this happened in her garden in Denver. She said, even if we don't know each other, we have to eventually talk to each other, to look at each other, to see what the other one is doing, or ask them for advice. So conversation comes easily. So those who came to the garden came for that too. They came to talk, to get to know people, whereas in cafes or public spaces, that wasn't necessarily the case. People are more in their bubbles. So kind of like Jill was saying, something about being in the garden get people to talk more. And the more they talk to others, the more competent and autonomous and better they felt about their skills, the more they stuck with it. So basic findings. People that didn't have the support, new gardeners that showed up there by themselves with no one else there, gardening started to feel like a chore. Kind of like Jill was saying, it wasn't enjoyable. But if they had like a friend there or people around them or work days, they, it became kind of fun and it, it didn't feel like a chore. It felt like something with ease that they could continue to learn together. So importantly, what we found is that important to adapt community gardening as a loneliness solution, really simple things can be uh, in, integrated into the garden to help new gardeners get more connected to others and to gardening. This looks like regular events, work days. We saw that a lot in France more commonly. Like, hey, on Wednesdays at 5, we're all here, one hour. You don't have to sign up, you just show up. We're here Sundays, three to four. These kind of the structures help people get integrated into the social fabric, so there's less like in-group in exclusivity because everyone shows up and works together. Um, or having a buddy system could be really helpful. Um, so anyways, if you want to learn more about this study, it's published last year in Wellbeing, Space, and Society, and also the year before in BMC Public Health. And um, I won't describe the Resetas project because Jill already did, but we're really, um, this gardening trials really helped build this research to see could these, um, could these findings apply to other natural settings, people hiking together, playing sports, doing arts and nature, meditating. Um, so we have a, a large consortium, um, people from all over the world. The study is taking place in six sites in um, Barcelona, Helsinki, Prague, Cuenca, Ecuador, and Melbourne, Australia, in Marseille, France. And um, we have partners from all over the world otherwise. Um, but as far as my dissertation, thank you so much to Jill, and thanks to all my supporters, and thank you for listening. So thank you very much, Ashby. The time was perfect, so thank you. And I don't know if some, someone wants to ask something. The tension. <laughs> OK, we have one. Well, of course, we as Green Initiatives, we recognize everything you say. Um, my question is, how do we implement this fast and wide? Sure, <laughs> great question. Thank you. So the question, how do we implement these findings and why? Um, so I think that the findings can be really straightforward. Basically, if someone is new to your garden, because you guys work in public gardens, you know there's a lot of turnover. A lot of new gardeners come in and they don't last and these beds sit fallow. How do you keep people doing it for the health reasons Jill described? So my recommendations are give them more social support. That doesn't mean you need to have the beleaguered garden director have more duties. Have, give them a buddy, someone else that's there to help them along the way, or have a regular work day, um, like I said, just once a week or more, and make it fun, because a lot of the work days are just like 
building the compost pile or something that's like work and everyone has kids and or they have responsibilities. So I think have fun events with a, maybe an aperitif like they do in France and get people to come because they want to be there. Um, I think that could be really helpful. But just for my research, I think um, social support, however you can integrate it, was really helpful. Okay, okay. Actually, the question was not, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's. I would just add that um, this for sure needs to be part of the permanent fabric of urban settings or communities. So it needs to be part of the plan, the master plans. Yesterday we learned a lot about a whole variety of planning at the Barcelona municipal level. So that's crucial, it has to be acknowledged. <laughs> and this is the same thing in all of our municipalities, is that we need to recognize it not as an afterthought. So, so it requires stakeholder engagement and partnerships and the networking and co-creations to get the voice of citizens together with planners. And the other piece is to continue to share this evidence to say it's not just something we feel good about. There's actually evidence that is supporting these changes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it takes us all talking to each other and sharing this information and not backing down because the gardens, people just roll their eyes and they think, oh, it's just another good idea that people feel good about. But no, actually, these are the kinds of investments we needed to do from the ground up. Uh, do you have some data about perhaps blood pressure or such things which, which are measurable in the health um, community, so you can just have arguments to, to show it's, it's really healthy, not just feeling good about. So we actually have done blood pressure work. We've done other kinds of physiological measures. We, had a, we actually took samples of the gut, uh, like feces, saliva, you know, to look at the gut microbiome and changes. Um, we took samples of the skin, not like actual skin, but the microbiome. <laughs> um, so these are, we can be building these biomarkers, you know, of change. And, but we also had objective measurements of physical activity, which is a pretty good indicator, an early indicator of what's happening cardiovascularly and other kinds of metrics that are good for health. So. Um, I think it's a good direction, but these studies are very expensive, you know, and to do this and invasive. So what we have found is that people don't like to have their blood taken. They'll put a cuff on, but you need the structure to do it. And that's really hard. In the Lancet? Okay. Can I? Um, in the Netherlands, we have uh, social uh, prescribing, welzijn op recept, and uh, there's now do being done uh, um, research to uh, find out why the nature-based solutions are not prescribed very often um, in Amsterdam. Th this year we will know more, and what, what is required um, to make it better. There is a question over there, there, and it will be the last one. Thank you. Um, when, at the, when you started, thank you for the presentations. At the beginning, you didn't mention the UK, but I see you have the UK as a, a study partner involved somehow. Um, I work on a social prescribing project in the UK, um, and we do have a formal framework for it. Um, there is an organization called the Social Prescribing Network in the UK, and I wondered if that was, were there similar structures in the other countries that are part of the study? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna let Jill take this question. So we have, um, University of West England is a partner, um, but we very much, are looking to connect. So we know about the DEFRA studies, the seven. Uh, we're starting to work with Michelle Howarth at Edge Hill. 
Um, I'm coming to London on the 30th with the intention of trying to connect, so can we talk? Okay. <laughs> We're very much trying to bridge, and it's been hard. So uh, we would welcome any thoughts you have and ideas. Okay, thank you very much. I just want to point out that there are studies, a lot of studies about the cortisol, uh, with cortisol, how, how, and it's a very good indicator to measure the levels of cortisol of the people, and it's, it, it's clearly shows that natural-based solution helps to reduce cortisol peaks. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the, our next speaker is Wendy Jelsta. Hello, Jelsta. She's a research scientist at the Norwegian Institute for Biochemical Research. She works with landscape monitoring, including research on the development and use of indicators of landscape spatial structure, biological diversity, cultural heritage, and public access accessibility and landscape preference. Her main research interests are linked, are linked to analysis of how human use of natural resources affects landscapes and influences different qualities in the landscape, including ecosystem and service, uh, ecosystem services. She worked with GIS and spatial analysis recording in the field and combines different types of data to monitor developments in landscape and their qualities. She's going to explain monitoring what motivates people to take part in a community garden. An example from Oslo, so whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to show an example from Oslo, from the living lab in the EDISITNET project. So I'll begin by introducing the living lab, which is uh, Linderud Community Garden. Then uh, say a little about why we're interested in motivations. Then I'll show you the method, which is the catchy name of SPLOT. Show you some results and comparing between years. And then finish with a few points for future work. So the Oslo Living Lab is the Linderud Community Garden. And their objective is to provide social and economic values and opportunities for citizens and entrepreneurs through knowledge transfer, networking, and infrastructure. And there are several different projects going on on this plot of land. It's about 7,000 square meters. Um, you can see the picture on the left there from 2019. It started as a, a waterlogged field. It had been a farm previously, and it's... Um, um, belonging to a museum, so although it's right in the town, it's been left, yeah, as a field. And then in 2020, this community garden was established. And it's now comprised, uh, there's a plot of community-supported agriculture where people buy a share to take part in the gardening together. There are test beds for business or socially oriented initiatives. They're working with soil improvement. They had to do quite a lot on drainage to get this thing started. And they're also, they have some educational work um, through the, especially in, in uh, cooperation with the Nature Management Secondary School, which is right next door. They have market days where they can sell their produce. And they've also been experimenting with different ways to create a wildflower meadow to attract pollinators to the garden. So we're focusing here on the neighborhood and local identity aspects because they're trying to increase the social cohesion. This is a neighborhood which has quite a few social problems, um, quite a lot of uh, immigrants, and they're trying to get better integration with the Norwegian population as well, with the different socioeconomic groups meeting and coming together. So we've been carrying out interviews with this plot method uh, in 2020, 21, and 22. And we've used, this is a cooperation with the, the master's program at, in public health science at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Uh, we've had a different group of students each year, but using the same methods. And each year we've produced one of these fact sheets helping the students to present their work. Uh, the fact sheets I had available, um, I don't know if people found them or not, they disappeared quite quickly, but I have one left of each if you want to have a look. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, it's time to say what SPLOT means. <laughs> so it stands for per Space, Person, Learning, Observation and Tracks. And it's a method that was developed by an anthropologist, Einar Hagen, at Oslo Met. Um, and it's, yeah, it's based on dialogue, drawings and keywords. Um, the observation aspect uh, is the, the person doing the study is observing how the participant is interacting with other people and with the space. Um, and the tracks relates to walking around the space together with the participant to learn as much as possible how they um, experience the space. Um, and we asked participants at the community garden to produce one splot about motivation, why they're, what motivates them to take part in the gardening, and one on their future wishes for the garden. And this is an example of a very simple splot. So it's become a verb to splot. So here I've just made a, a word cloud of the, the words. They're in Norwegian, of course. <laughs> but I've um, translated them, the most important words uh, in the lists here. So gardening's the top one, vegetables, but people comes very high up. Nice activities, social community, flowers, pleasant food, nature, farming, learning, plants, organic, together. Um, there's, that's just yeah, the most common words, and then there are a great many other motivations as well. Um, so how do you sum up motivations? Well, we've reclassified into six main groups. Um, and you can see in the diagram, this is from 2020. So the social aspects were as important as the gardening. And interestingly, also feelings and aesthetics and there were, there were big reasons for why people take part in community gardening. Um, we, each year there's been, a, there's been a member check at the annual evaluation meeting for the garden uh, to see whether the people there agree with the results that the students have come up with. So the people who are answering, the, who are being interviewed are not necessarily present at these meetings. So just to make sure that the results are recognizable by all members. Yeah, just an example of the social aspects. There are many different keywords that come up. Um, why people want to meet up with others. I think I'll just, you can read it quickly. <laughs> and feelings and emotions, close to nature, peace and quiet, calming activity, break from everyday life. Memories, interestingly, some of the um, crops being grown are crops from people's homelands. So there's people from Pakistan trying to grow things that they recognize from home and they get the smells from the garden that reminds them of home. And yes, a form of medicine for both physical and mental health. So the participants recognize that even if the doctors don't yet. <laughs> okay, the differences between years. So in 2022, we found that there was actually more focus on the gardening um, and there was less focus on the feelings and aesthetics but the social aspects still remain important. That's been important through each year. And we wonder whether this is reflecting a move from the visionary startup phase of the garden. You know, the people are coming in and seeing what will we do with this space? And now they're putting those dreams into practice in the actual gardening. Or perhaps the dreamers have been replaced by more practical people. So we don't actually know um, how much turnover there is in the garden. So that's something to look for in the next uh, studies, I think. Um, we also asked participants at the evaluation meeting to grade um, to which degree participation in the community garden had given them a feeling of less stress, um, opportunities for contact with natural surroundings, a healthier lifestyle, financial gain. You can see financial gain scored the worst of these <laughs> different motivations. Um, so they're scoring from zero to five. And it was the opportunity for contact with natural surroundings, which really came out on top. Though I would say that all of the scores are really quite positive. <laughs> and a sense of belonging. I mean, that relates to the loneliness issue. So we know that all of these different uh, indicators have been proven in other, in other connections to be positive for, social, for both physical and, and mental health, but we don't have the direct links in this study. 
Uh, yeah, we also asked them to tell us about their future wishes for the garden. So, yeah, um, 2020 and 2021, there were quite a lot of kind of infrastructure things, like they wanted a toilet at the garden. That's quite essential, really. <laughs> they also wanted a long picnic table, a uh, place where they could meet outdoors and indoors as well, an indoor space for socializing, especially during the winter, which is quite long in Norway. They wanted more activities in the winter. Uh, in 2022, some of these needs had been met. They have a toilet. <laughs> and they also have a picnic table and an outdoor meeting place. Um, they still wanted an indoor space. Um, but importantly, in 2022, um, they wanted the garden to persist because they knew that the Eddie Sitnet funding was coming to an end. And what happens now? Will we be able to fund continued activity in the garden? So for future work, um, we're hoping that the students from the university will continue helping us with this, um, perhaps even also after Eddie Sitnet finishes, but we certainly have one more summer for some interviews. Um, we'd like to go into a bit more depth of recording some variables of socioeconomic status so that we can see whether um, motivations differ between different groups. Um, yeah, also gender and ethnicity, and especially how long the participants have been participating in the gardening, in, both in the community garden and how uh, familiar they are with gardening generally. Uh, are there differences in motivations for long-timers compared to newcomers? And can we use this information in recruiting new members? And then the bottom one, the bottom thing here, are there lasting health benefits? So this is what we really want to find out. And this is, you know, another of these hundreds of um, qualitative observational studies, which gives you a little bit more information, but we really need the solid evidence to show that this is having an impact so that we can convince um, the politicians and the, not, not least the, the health workers that this is something that could be used in social prescribing because that would, that would really help with the fast and wide implementation if we could have the health service involved and actually getting people involved in, in community gardening. Um, I'll just finish with some acknowledgements. So, um, Sebastian Eiter, my colleague from Nibio, you've probably seen him at the conference here. Uh, he's been involved in this throughout. Uh, and another two partners in the Eddy Sitnet project, um, the city of Oslo and uh, Kim from Nabolagshage. Kim isn't here, but there are other people from Nabolagshage. And then um, Sherry Lee Bastian from the University of Life Sciences. And then there's um, a list of the students who've been helping us. And here you can see them trying to recruit people to interview <laughs> at one of the market days at Linderud. OK, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Wendy. I don't know, we have time for one question. Hi. Just, where do we find information about how to use this, is it the SPLOT methodology? Because it looks a really interesting way of okay. evaluating. Yeah, well, it was quite new for us as well. They've been teaching it at the university, so they actually have access to the anthropologist who's made uh, this method. Um, she's described it in a book. Um, I can give you the reference. Um, I think you get the slides and the reference is, in, is on the slide as well. Um, yeah, and I can show you these. I have, still have some of these pop things left. I think the reference is on that. So I can give you one of those fact sheets. Mm. Okay, so thank you again. Thank you. When? Now we have time for some discussion. Four yeah. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our last speaker is Harmen Slip. Harmen is working as a gardener in the Groene Oas at South Rotterdam since May 2020. He supports the vegetable gardeners, guides the volunteers in the community garden and makes the annual garden plan. Besides taking care of the plants and people in the garden, Harman collaborates with other green projects in Rotterdam in exploring great ideas for ne new green activities. Harman also supervises content with the Rotterdam municipality and subs subsidizer on behalf of the foundation. 
Since 2022, he's also responsible for nature and environmental education for public education. So I guess you are going to speak from there? Uh, a time of uh, yes, you, you will need uh, okay. yeah. Yeah. The, I, um, yeah. uh, I really want to invite you to come sit in a circle um, we're now on the end uh, of the conference and oh Um, I think we are okay right now. Uh, this morning um, we uh, waked up in our apartment after uh, the whole week of uh, busy uh, lectures and IDs. And um, we had a conversation about what, what happened here in uh, Barcelona. Uh, Yesterday, I followed the tour to the wrecked Comtel, uh, the a nice uh, uh, water flow, which is um, uh, uh, repaired uh, in, a, in a nice boulevard for, uh, with nature and, and, and uh, uh, walking uh, paths. And I uh, saw uh, children feeding the ducks, and I saw little ducklings, I saw sparrows in the in the, in the bushes, and it was quite a natural um, uh, inhabitant. And uh, then I thought, oh, this is, this is nice. Actually, we are on the end of the line. In my, in my work, I'm on the end of the line. I'm organizing uh, this kind of uh, com community gardens. I invite people to come over and work with us, and uh, I, I notice their benefits, their health benefits. But I'm still on the end of the line, and um, we have um, yeah, we have a lot to do with uh, 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 municipalities, um, and um, but yeah, we're working in in the in the practice. And finally, uh, in this in these days, you see a lot of uh, IDs, uh, uh, a lot of infographics, a lot of uh, research, a lot of. Uh, genius minds who are really good investigating and, and, and finding uh, foundings and uh, but I love the practice and um, yesterday from our uh, restaurant meeting we drove to our hotel and the, the streets were, were, were opened and, and everywhere were bricks and stuff and earlier that day I saw um, uh, um, an infographic of the green corridors which would be made in Barcelona and then I thought oh wow something is happening it's it's a chaos but there is a, a, a green movement going on in the cities we we can see in those infographics and in all those studies so we discovered that it's there's actually a, a line I'm, I'm on the end of the line and there is a um, a beginning in organization, in, in ID development. And we discovered together in our little little meeting on the breakfast table from, hey, it's not only a line, but it's also a circle. Um, we are all part in this circle. Uh, uh, we can, we have, 
yeah, we can in influence each other. We need uh, the people on the floor who, who, who work in the gardens, who grow the vegetables. But we also need the people who uh, uh, are, the, are the minds of, of, of making uh, studies, uh, 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 find foundings. And we're sitting now in, in a sort of circle. Um, because the whole week we were sitting in lines and, and looking to people and watch them uh, uh, from, from ahead. So actually um, we would ask everybody uh, um, what for influence you can have to an organization or when you're in an organization or when you uh, working on your PET or, or making uh, health uh, reports, uh, how can you influence uh, the working floor? So I thought maybe it's nice as a closure of, of this day to have a kind of informal discussion uh, with each other. Maybe uh, somebody will react. Uh, how, how can you influence in different ways? Um, if I under understand what you're saying, what I've got from the conference is the idea to go back and try and work on a what's it called? urban agriculture strategy with my local authority. So we're a community organization, but to try and do that together because that knits us in and it gets them on board, but also this evidence gathering um, and to be able to, because I think people sort of think, well, you're just growing a few carrots really, but it's much bigger than that, and to, yeah. and to get that evidence together and get it together in the project so that we, yeah, and get universities to help us measure as well, maybe, and our local health trust to, to fund a project where they can measure the impact. Okay, so I think um, I've really seen that I need to be communicating like everywhere to get the information out, to raise awareness um, also in the media because, you know, if people hear more about this and about the different health benefits, then they're more likely to be interested and the politicians will discover that food strategies, you know, this is something that's really up and coming and you need to get a move on and, and get it working in practice. There are just so many benefits in relation to climate change as well and keeping green areas in the city. So it's really win-win and we need to get that message out time and time again everywhere from yeah, newspapers to politicians and maybe also political lobbying, which I know you're doing some of in, in Rotterdam. Yeah. You can send your... <laughs> Um, I think the, 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 the problem that I find it, what, what, uh, from the perspective in Scotland is that a lot of the, the funding is very short term, um, so we end up with a situation where people are kind of, so my, my own project has kind of shrunk and then expanded and then shrunk and then expanded and it'd be quite nice to get some more consistency um, and just, you know, and, and maybe be a bit more planned about what we do because I feel a lot of the time, I mean, the, the, it seems much more purposeful of the stuff I've seen in Barcelona. What, what happens in, in Glasgow anyway is that people tend to set things up as a pet project and then so that person goes away yeah. and it's, it's not necessarily supported by the community. Sometimes, a lot of the time it is, but sometimes it's not. Um, and it's without that, that, or without that person kind of like geeing people on, then maybe, maybe it kind of doesn't really work terribly well. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that's, a, that's generally what happens, but I have seen it happen, certainly. I think um, one thing in just, there was a conference recently in Madrid with public gardens and parks in Spain, and the theme was nature and health, and a lot of the participants that were there are municipal leaders or garden parks and rec leaders, and they said the reason they care about this is because the politicians care about this health, and it's a way to convince them to fund um, this more broadly as far as maintenance for parks and gardens. So um, I think 
exactly what you, uh, everyone is saying, is that it makes people want to care more because it's something people can latch on to. So yeah. that message seems to be really attractive. And it, but the other thing is, of course, that I get, I'm guessing that in, in terms of uh, preventing bigger issues later, which are more difficult mm -hmm. to deal with, that, that's, that's, maybe that's the selling point. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that, you know, if you, if you can have some people working in this healthy, healthier way, then, you know, it's a, they, they won't have the, the same level of coronary heart disease or whatever further down the line. Yeah, in, the, in Montpellier, where we did the study, the leader of the green um, area of the cities um, in that division said the reason that they funded the parks was to bring people together. That was one of the main reasons they built the gardens. So I think looking at the loneliness epidemic and all these social problems that we're seeing in mental health, um, as you're saying, it's a preventative. Um, that's persuasive. I would also just add that it's the long game. It takes a long time. And if I could give one example is the gardens in Denver. When the program was starting in the early 2000s, every year they had people complaining to city council, calling, shut the site down, it was ugly, it wasn't well kept, da 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 da. With more education and actually a shifting aesthetic of like what is beautiful in Colorado, a desert, it's very dry. Uh, there are zero complaints now. And they've expanded. They went from 40 to 180 in 10 years. But people have learned to accept it, and it has become a gem of the city rather than like a liability. And then on the health side, I would share that I would go to the clinical offices of our, my researchers at the medical school and say, I really want to work with you because I think this is something we could do together. They literally showed me the door. That was 10 years ago. And then 10 years later, I'm plenary speaker at their conferences. They've totally now embraced it as part of primary care. So it takes time and like really being clear about the message, at least from us, like what we can contribute is stay the course. <laughs> like you said, be forceful about you know, what it is we're trying to say. Small bites and be consistent. And people come around. Yeah, so one, before, I know you said your, but I'm wondering who in this line that we mentioned before, who do we need most in this line? Do you have an idea? I think, it, so one of the things we do is social network analysis and we look at stakeholders and how they're working together. It's exactly this question of like, what do you contribute? What do you bring and then what do you get? And this kind of reciprocity. Um, so we'd like to think of it as an ecosystem of stakeholders. And depending on the issue and the challenge, you activate these nodes. But know the nodes, and some can be weak, some might be strong, but be careful of the strong ones because we work together, let's say, we always come together, we have our monthly meetings, we all know each other, it's impossible to break in. So knowing that you've got this really strategic partner who is a policymaker or is gonna run for office or something, activating that when you need it Keeping those relationships, even though they're not as strong, they become incredibly valuable. So thinking of it as nodes in the network and how you activate depending on what the issue is, you know, you're positioned and ready. And then have the evidence there <laughs> in case someone just tries to roll their eyes and say, no, this is not what we're going to spend our money on. And, uh, it's good that you take uh, the notice of time because uh, in, in, in Rotterdam, I don't know how it's, it is in other cities, uh, sometimes there is a lack of time in projects uh, because uh, sometimes they are on uh, uh, grounds which are uh, rebuilt again, so probably it's for a few years. Then uh, a lot of people are involving in those uh, projects, and uh, later on uh, uh, it needs to be collapsed because uh, uh, there is a new uh, building project uh, going on. So uh, what can we do for each other? Uh, probably uh, uh, you can influence uh, municipality to um, uh, make sure that uh, um, the time for this kind of projects become longer, uh, that uh, uh, trees can grow normally instead of four year time and then uh, put, put away and social systems can grow. Because sometimes in our um, experience and in our uh, practice, there's a, a short time lapse actually. Uh, 
from uh, what I also found interesting was that the Oslo uh, David David from Austria um, I was uh, inspired also by the, the Oslo case when because they built their uh, support for agriculture for the urban agriculture on child or on a youth uh, program so it's uh, I think it's important to link, although it's sometimes difficult to link your activities with urban strategies uh, which might uh, fit, which is a, uh, a big learning uh, that I take also from the Barcelona case. Um, and uh, what you also experience in Graz, which is the second biggest city in Austria, that you have to reframe, uh, because we all talk about benefits. It's, it's clear for us, but we experience that uh, it's always about a private hobby. The gardening is just like lifestyle arguments, and we, uh, it, it's, it's important to have this also, but uh, it says, okay, that's your private thing, you can do what you want, but uh, you do not get really uh, support when it's uh, at that level. So it, I think it's uh, good also to frame this discourse away from this private thing and to make really, this is a public health issue actually. Can I add just one point you reminded me? The other thing about the social network is thinking about gardens as nodes and that they can kind of activate and they're part of something bigger. So in Barcelona, it's very informal. There isn't this, there's a movement, but it kind of happens each neighborhood rather than becoming like a unified voice. So maybe that's also what some stakeholders can do is help unify that voice because I think that goes a long way. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say something based on my experience and that there is thinking about the line I think it's really important to be um, user centered and to think about the criteria of who is coming into your project and whether it has a therapeutic clinical basis which means that it needs to be a much more protected space and isn't about general volunteering and to put that expectation on people potentially who are quite vulnerable as opposed to projects which are designed to be more open and flexible to different participants. It's quite an important thing to think about. Um, do we still have some time? I guess so. Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, now we're sitting in a circle and uh, I think uh, this is how community gardens also work. Uh, everybody uh, takes its piece and everybody uh, uh, is involved in their own uh, power and in their own needs and uh, uh, together you make a community and together uh, you uh, take care for your health benefits and grow gar uh, uh, nice flowers and, and you, you grow those uh, vegetables and you make all those plants for, for uh, involving schools or, or elderly people or disabled people and uh, even in this circle we can have in a brief moment a lot of ideas and starting a community in this EDISITNET uh, system. Um, so we're not part of the EDISET network, we didn't know anything about it before the conference and I'm just wondering if there's any way of sharing this information so there's a kind of node for information and were you going to say, oh. We have this uh, EDISITNET platform, which is uh, a catalogue of all the different Edible City solutions that are an initiative um, that are taking part in the EDISITNET project. And we've been working on it through the project, and it's now in a, like a new version, more user-friendly and better than ever. And that's <laughs> going to be launched in June. So. And that's got yeah. all the evidence in there, has it? It's got a lot yeah, of Yeah, so then that it, that's got a map with all the different solutions. You can go in, you can read what other people are doing nearby you or in a different country. You can see the things that they're, yeah, that the objectives of their garden, what they're maybe measuring. Um, you can get in touch with people. And there'll also be a, a module in this platform with different information that you can just read about how you could 
monitor in your garden or yeah, the different health benefits. So it just links to lots of different information. Brilliant. Yeah. And I'm sure they'll send when the when it's to be launched, I'm sure they'll send the invitation to everybody who's been there at this okay. meeting. Brilliant. Yeah. And we encourage everybody to put in information about their projects in the in the platform. We can do that without yeah. being part of okay. yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is the last year of uh, EdisipNet. Uh, I'm, I'm just involved. This is my first uh, uh, meeting abroad. But um, it's nice to uh, think about future and how EdisipNet is, is con <coughs> continuing. And, uh, um, yeah, because now this, I guess, two years, three years of uh, EdisipNet uh, four, uh, there are a lot of ideas and, and uh, have somebody an opinion of how uh, this is continuing and uh, what what people are want to do in this in this structure it's a question difficult but question maybe also the end <laughs> Yes, I think the platform will be like the main no? result at long term, the, the platform of FDCNet to share, no? to begin sharing the contacts, events, etc. Yeah. Yes, there is last event in Berlin, I think in September, maybe. All right. Well, um, I think this is uh, what it was. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.